Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no doubt. Well, uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, today, I've got one of my best friends, Derek Height. Um, Derek is amazing in every way. You all would have just watched the podcast with his better half, Lena, and she's amazing, and they have a beautiful family, uh, lives out in Vancouver a lot of the time, although they do travel a ton. Uh, Derek, welcome to Marketeers Clubhouse. Thanks for having us. Oh, of course. Well, it's just you. I speak, I speak for the family. You speak for the family. Uh, Derek is so important to me. In fact, there's a picture of me and Derek at Derek's wedding behind me uh, right there. And uh, his company icon or logo up in behind me. And today I'm especially wearing a very grubby, because I did some ranch work in it, RVRD hat that matches Derek's hat uh, that was gifted we'll to me. One. Yeah, I could use a new one because I kind of wreck them and I'm slowly going bald. So I'm going to wear them more and more. Although I prefer cowboy hats, but you know, headphones. It's the ranch. It's the ranch. Uh, DH, uh, thank you for being here. Can you give everyone a little bit of a, before we get into what you're doing now, which is so exciting and I can see so many cool things in behind you. I see a drone. I see an amazing vehicle with a giant Ukraine on it. We're going to get into what you guys do now, um, and it's huge. But I'd like you to go back to young Derek, um, cover off who you are, what your background is, how you got into the world of film. Um, and I, I want to know it all. So g give me a little bit of that. Well, that's a funny one. You're uh, you're an integral part of, of that background, too. So. Um... Well, I'll not in a, not in a creepy, touchy uncle kind of way either. Just like well, in a like friend a, way. You were a bigger brother. Let's put it that way. <laughs> bigger brother. Okay, I love it. But uh, yeah, no, grew up in Calgary. Um, you know, grew up like any other kid in Calgary, skateboarding, snowboarding. You know, trying to live in the cold temperatures, and um, so yeah, I I, uh, I took on. You know, when I was a kid, uh, uh, how do you start? You know, it was 10, 10 paper routes and 15 lawns to cut every weekend and would shovel everyone's walks. Um, my parents, I guess they trained me young to work hard and, uh, you know, tackle tackle more than you can chew off, uh, bite more than you can chew off. But, um, uh, yeah, just uh, worked my ass off when I was a kid. And then a couple of good friends of mine that I would always skateboard with, uh, they got me into snowboarding. And uh, that was like the early days. It was probably about, I'd say, 89 uh, when you used to have to get licenses in Alberta, ASA licenses. Um, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, you, you know, go hit up uh, Wintergreen and COP, uh, you know, every chance I could. And, uh, um, yeah, just, you know, started doing contests while I was still in school. Um, nationals. Uh, you know, went to a lot of big, big provincial national contests and, um, and just knew I wanted to try and go somewhere in snowboarding. And, um, and then funny enough, uh, one of my, one of my jobs, uh, when I was, uh, when I was snowboarding more, was working at a place called Iguana Snowboarding Accessories, which was just downstairs of the snowboard shop, which was on 17th Ave. And, uh, so I used to ride my bike down there, uh, after school and go, pour wax and, you know, make leashes and all that kind of funny stuff. Shout out and to Graham Strobel, who, there you go, who Graham. was the owner of Iguana. And Ken, I think, I think Ken had a hand in it, Ken Achenbach, or at least yeah. it was in the basement of it. So yeah. I know they were connected. Ken had his hands and everything. <laughs> um, and then funny enough, ran into you. So you were, uh, I mean, I always knew about you. And, uh, and I remember when you worked upstairs and uh, there was a day when, I remember either I came upstairs or you came downstairs and you came up and you said, Hey, uh, good buddy of mine, Mark Gallup has got a, a shoot going on in uh, Island Lake Lodge, um, for Transworld. I think you should go. I'm going to put your name in there. And, uh, I remember I was like, yeah, you're kidding me. Like, I'm sorry. I'm going to miss some school and go cat skiing. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it was, it was Mark Gallup too, who was a senior at Transworld snowboarding magazine. So, uh, you know, I was pretty, pretty blown away. And, uh, so yeah, that whole thing came together. Uh, it was my very first shoot, uh, as a, you know, athlete and, uh, things went really well. And, 
Uh, I think a couple we had a couple shots run from that from that magazine shoot too. So it uh, I'd say that was sort of the start of the start of my career. Thanks to you, um, that was amazing. You know, the, let me let me put the backstory to that. I saw Ken getting all these free cat trips and writing stories, and I said, you know, I think I could do that. So I asked Ken. I said, Hey, is it cool if I I want to go on a cat trip and I don't want to pay? <laughs> yeah. And he's like, he's like, yeah, Kalon, no problem, no problem. And I knew Mark Gallup good enough because he was filming or not filming, but shooting a little bit of mountain bike stuff. And I was obviously mountain biking at the time. And I'm like, I, so I arranged him, uh, and then levered Island Lake. And I was like, okay, I need to now actually go get good riders. Cause I am terrible. Uh, so I think I took, I can't quite remember, but it was you and Lyndon Cormack and someone yeah, else. Lyndon. Yeah. And we all went out and I had a, I had a image, a picture of me at a full page. I think it was trans world Japan of me, which was unbelievable. Cause I think I landed one jump that day. <laughs> yeah. And then, um, I know that Lyndon had something running. You had a bunch of stuff running cause you're actually good, but yeah, it was an absolute, uh, young man scam to get out and write a story and go out and do it. And it just ended up working out so great. And I got to meet one of my best friends, which inevitably in the end is you, uh, many years later. So, it, uh, it was so cool that I could take, like, you were the best kid in town. There was nobody even close to you. So I, I, strangely enough, you were surprised I asked you, but I probably walked down the stairs with my fingers crossed going, if Derek doesn't go, I'm not going to get anything to actually work. And I remember Gallup being psyched because he had heard about you, uh, ripping it up in all the local stuff and was just so psyched to have young blood out there. Uh, that, you know, wasn't, you know, John Boyer or uh, any of the sort yeah, of guys. He was older that too, are, anyways. Yeah, he already sort of <laughs> cracked the cracked the seal on on his popularity. But anyways, that's that's where the back end of that comes from. So, so sorry to derail yeah. you. So you're 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 young. You get your first photo shoot. Um, you got to meet me. I got to meet you. Uh, a lifelong friendship started. Where'd you go from there? Hell yeah. Uh, well, funny enough, uh, I gra it's kind of funny. I think I graduated in 92 or 93. I can't remember now, but, um, literally the day I graduated from high school, um, my parents, I, I was, I already packed, uh, I was leaving for Whistler the next day I left for Whistler and my parents drove me to the, uh, the Greyhound bus in, you know, downtown Calgary. And, uh, you know, I had four bags, four duffel bags. I had, you know, emptied out my whole room. I even brought like gym weights. So one of the, the bags alone <laughs> weighed 150 pounds of like barbell <laughs> weights. Every time they unloaded it out of the bus, the guy was, you know, dropped in on his toes and it was pretty, pretty funny. But um, yeah, I packed up what I needed and uh, was going to spend the summer doing uh, the Camp of Champions, uh, you know, something that we always, you know, look forward to. Another great Ken, Ken Auchenbach uh, uh, venture. And, um, and that was it. I mean, I was sold, uh, that one summer, you know, when I was there after it was done, I started looking for a place to live in Whistler and knew that that's where I had to go. Um, you know, at that when, time when you were up at the, were you at, when you were up at the camp, were you a camper or were you a coach? You were a camper. A coach. Oh, yeah, you went Ken, up and coached. Yeah. 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 Ken, um, yeah. Ken, Ken, I mean, I, it was one of those things you, you were, it was my first year. I think I was a digger. So, you know, I was up there digging the pipe and, and doing what I could uh, to to be able to ride, uh, you know, every day and, you know, coach kids if they asked. I don't think mm. I was officially coached for that first year. Mm. Um, and that was actually my first time. Actually, it wasn't my first time to Whistler. I had another time. It was my first time to Whistler, but that was another funny story. Um, so, but I knew after that, that was a West Beach, uh, West Beach classic is the first time I ever went there. And I went there with a buddy, uh, this was maybe a year before. And that was my first time in Whistler. And it was like, I love this place. Um, but that summertime I moved there, that was my first summer in Whistler and, um, and summer camp. So I'd never seen, never seen the camp before, never been in Whistler in the summer before. And it was, it was awesome. You know, all the yeah, best for riders. anyone who's never, yeah. Anyone who's never been there. You, you show up and you sort of shuttle a couple chairlifts to get up to sort of snow line, any bare minimum, I think. And then um, you just go bus. up and up and up. Yeah, a bus up into this glacier. And it is so fun and it's so cool. And there's a lake down in Whistler and a skate park. And 
tons and tons of like when you were young, when I was there and young, I w went to the camp a couple of times, just fooling around, you know, snowboarding, but I went mountain biking there a lot. And Whistler in the summer is just like the funnest place that you could possibly be as a kid. Like it's a teenage, a loose, like unencumbered with parents, teenagers dream yeah. is Whistler. <laughs> like it's unreal. Your parents would not be happy if they came and watched what you were doing. No, no. Uh, but I was a good boy. Maybe not, you know, my parents would have looked at no. me and said, oh, he's yeah. perfect. No, you and me both. We were, yes, we were, we were doing good stuff. Yes. But how exactly. sad is that, that there is no more, no more glacier. The kids these days don't get to, uh, don't get to go up there anymore. The whole thing is Shut down. And long gone. No T-bars all gone. gone. Yep. Yeah, well. in, our, in our lifetime. Yep. That sucks. There's no yeah. doubt. Um, so you're in Whistler and your snowboarding is firing up and I've already said it. You were the best out of our area. And then very quickly, you were the best in Canada or one of the best in Canada really quickly. What was your next jump to get there? Like you stayed in Whistler, you planted yourself there. Um, yeah, that was, when, that was a whole nother story within its own. It, we, you know, that summer after the camp ended, I started looking around to, you know, where am I going to live? What am I going to do? You know, my, I had sponsors at that time. Um, you know, Burton was one of them. Um, uh, I think Oakley came on a little bit longer, but uh, Smith was one of them. And, um, you know, just trying to make it work, trying to, trying to see if I could live there for the season. And, um, uh, we ended up finding a place in staff accommodations up in Whistler, which was just the, you know, it's a great option, but the worst place to ever spend more than a year. It, it was <laughs> the stuff that I saw happen there. My God. Um, but anyways, we ended up finding a good, good group of friends that are still my buddies today that were, you know, not really pro snowboarders. They were just there for fun Had moved there from other parts of Canada and uh, became lifelong friends as well. And they, um, yeah, we ended up finding a house in Creekside, um, a good buddy of mine, uh, who segue into my future years of getting into another industry, uh, got me into that side, but, um, we, we all lived together. Um, and myself and this, my buddy Dean, we, uh, worked at a Boston pizza, uh, night, night shift. So we would go down there, um, <laughs> you know, at four o'clock when the mountain closed, after we'd been riding all day long, go down, we would make pizza dough, you know, do like whatever, like 400 pizza doughs a night. Uh, we had the record amount of pizza doughs ever made by anyone at a Christmas or New Year's, you know, real wish. I still have that trophy somewhere in my house, but um, <laughs> we ended up working at that place for about six months, or at least I did. Um, so we, we worked there. Uh, making pizza doughs every night, getting home at like two, three in the morning. And then we would go to, uh, you know, go back home, which is just up the hill from there and uh, wake back up at 8 a.m. and just go ride all day long, eight to four every day. Um, you know, early 90s, you know, when there was snow falling every day, it was just deep how Whistler was undeveloped. And, um, and then about, I'd say six months into that job, I started getting a phone call. Uh, one of the bigger, wow. Well, more notable things, you know, I was shooting magazines and stuff and still doing contests at that point, um, doing some movies. And um, I got a call from Warren Miller. They actually phoned Boston Pizza. Uh, this is back before cell phones were even around 90, 95. And uh, so Warren Miller Productions phoned my boss at Boston Pizza and said, hey, we're looking for Derek Kite. This is Warren Miller. And so my boss at the time, Kirk, he was like, you know, you know, bullshit. Like, this isn't Warren Miller. And... <laughs> You know, what kind Does of Warren need this? a double pepperoni mushroom? What does he need? Yeah. <laughs> it was really funny. I mean, how do you get a hold of people back in the early 90s, right? It was a fax machine yeah. or it was a landline. And so he phones Boston Pizza and uh, and they're like, hey, we want to go on a take you to a trip to China. And, uh, you know, and so I had it on speakerphone in my boss's office. And he's like, hey, you know, it's next, you know, it's in two weeks. We're getting a visa for you and uh, we want you to come out and you're going to be a snowboarder on the on this movie. And so, you know, I hung up the phone and my boss is like, you're fired. Get out of here. You know, this is amazing. And uh, he, he just let it, he let things fly and he, uh, he let me go on the strip. And then, you know, after that, uh, pretty much after that, I started getting, you know, contracted with my sponsors and getting paid enough that I didn't have to, you know, 
work at a job anymore. So um, definitely one of the coolest bosses. Um, uh, That's I think it's amazing. my only, only restaurant I ever worked at in my life too, but uh, it was a good, it was a good time. So it's nah, amazing. And for, for people listening that don't know, Warren Miller movies were the shit back in the day. They were the original ski movie and he would like full 35, uh, like 35 millimeter is correct. Right. Camera like the big film style cameras, he would go out and shoot ski movies. There was no digital. There was nothing. He was shooting this on film and they were campy and they were kind of silly. And there was always like a hilarious ski ballet in the middle of them. There were all these things, but as like, these were literally the first ski movies that ever existed. And they would go to large, large venues that would hold, you know, what is the Jubilee Auditorium in Calgary hold there? 8,000 people. It's probably fairly large. And they would sell out for a week. People would just be so excited to go see these movies. So for you to get in that back in the day was unbelievable. I remember just being like, this is crazy. And the snowboard movies were just starting to come out in that period, which mm -hmm. is a really cool segue because you started getting different. There was different opportunities and you started getting interested in film and all these things before we get past that you're an olympian and you were a pro snowboarder. i'm that old not many yeah <laughs> not many people get to say this were you at the very first olympics that snowboarding was in is that an accurate statement yeah in uh nagano uh 98 so amazing uh, it was the, the first year um yeah it was a pretty pretty funny experience um uh, yeah, we, I, we, I don't think I would say it's funny. I would say it's amazing <laughs> and congratulations. I think you there, you're probably underplaying this dramatically, but uh, you're an Olympian. That's awesome. Do you have a little Olympic tattoo somewhere that you're hiding and you're secretly super proud of it? No. Dang. I was really hoping that was a thing and that you were going to show me that, but okay. I got a ring now. It's kind of like I'm that. sure you do. And you were also a torchbearer at the Vancouver Olympics, uh, which was really cool. Uh, lots of yeah, cool photos of that. And you, yeah. And you actually have the torch somewhere. Do you not? Yeah. Yeah. That's in my office. Yeah. No, that was it brought back, uh, great memories, uh, being able to, uh, to be a part of the, you know, 2010 in Vancouver on that end for sure. Amazing. Was, yeah. Unbelievable. Yeah, no, it 2010, was, the year I met your wife, by the way. Which... Oh boy. That's right. You stole her away from me. That's what I heard. And I did not steal her away from you. I <laughs> emceed your wedding. That's exactly what I did. I cheered you on. If anyone needs an MC, line. you should really, Jamie's the best. Yeah. I've got, I've got an MC gig this summer already. So my schedule's full. I do one a year, <laughs> one a year. Um, so you're, you're a pro athlete. You have done all sorts of amazing things. I look at life uh, a little differently than a lot of people. And this segues into sort of the world you're at. I look at everyone individually and I do this for my sake and other people's sake um, to try to control ego and my position in things. But when I look at my life, I'm the star of my own movie. When I look at my wife, she is the star of her own movie. She is a guest star in my life and I am a guest star in her life because we are so important to each other. And then there's bit players within this um, and some more important than others. I hope I, I hold a decent uh, guest, you know, a, a, a guest appearance as a reoccurring character in your movie. Um, you're that the, is your main, life. You're the main actor in, in my movie. Mm, I don't believe I'm the main actor in your movie, but I appreciate that as a, a kind thing you said, but uh, I, I literally do look at that. And when I give advice to people, when I'm talking to them, um, I always look at them when they're tossed on something. I go, you're, you're making and writing your own movie, which is your life right now. This is your world. I am a bit player in your world. Don't think about me. Think about what you need to do to get to the next thing. Where in your movie do you want this to go to? And as much as someone would care about me or these other things, in the end, and the reason that I am a guest star in my wife's life is I might not be there the whole time. I might die early. I may, you know, God forbid, get hit by a bus tomorrow and her life and her movie needs to continue. That's part of the reality of this. And it's a sad reality, but it's kind of the way I look at things. And I think it's important. It checks our ego. When I'm in an argument with someone in someone's life, I am the idiot who cut them off in a giant sprinter van and then gave them the finger 
because I thought they were wrong. I am that guy in someone's movie, which is unbelievable. I've been the drunk uncle in my nephew's movie. I've been the uncle that took a mountain biking. I am like the bad boss in some instances. I'm different roles in everyone's movies. In the movie that I see in front of you that you're crafting, one, not every month's movie is really interesting. Yours is epically interesting. And you've filled it with amazing characters and you do, you've written a story for your own life that is almost unbelievable in a lot of instances. Most people would kill to, to put done, even what you've done to this point would be an epic life for a human. And you've transitioned from young athlete who works hard as hell to a pro snowboarder who worked hard as hell. Uh, you didn't mention it, but I'm going to mention it through being a pro snowboarder who didn't piss it all away in drugs and alcohol and travel and fuckery that can come with being a pro snowboarder. Cause there is, you know, as well as I do, most money that gets made by pro snowboarders ends up in bad spaces. You didn't, you bought a house in Whistler and then you, made a fortune on real estate and you've leapfrogged this and you work hard as hell. You've, you've had your fun, but you had this incredible amount of control and the vision to see past it. And when I think about you, I get jealous because you've, you're not many people in my life. I'm jealous. Of. Almost not. I've said this to Mark Walton, who's my business partner. I've said this to my beautiful wife, Harper. I'm jealous of you in a lot of ways. You have lived an amazing life. So, You've killed it in a few things. You've got amazing real estate. You've got this beautiful family, uh, two children, um, uh, a beautiful, very accomplished wife. Um, and you got this insane business that you're sitting in right now. And explain what, what I see behind me. I see a drone uh, and I have a, uh, a drone on my hat. I see a very expensive vehicle with a giant thing sitting off of it. Yep. And then I see a really cool off-road vehicle with another giant thing ha hanging off of it. Um, the company you're at now is Revered Cinema, uh, which is up in behind me right there. Um, and it's by short called RVRD. And can you please explain uh, in not so humble terms, because if you're too humble about it, I'm going to jump in what you guys do and your position in the movie industry in Canada and slightly like, just give me a little background of how you got there, who you started with. I know your, your partner, Jason, well. Um, so give me a little background of where you got to, and then we're going to get in to not talk about the movie that is Derek's life, although it's a big part of it, but I also want to talk about the movie business. Sure. So hit me. Uh, well, let me take it back to, um, um, I owe all of that, um, the hard work, the saving your money thing, all to my parents. My mom and dad were very, when I was raised, it was they, my mom was from Switzerland, my dad's from Germany. They were very, um, the way they raised us was to save your money. You know, uh, I always, I really always appreciated and listened to what my parents always, uh, you know, how they raised us, how they taught us. Um, I felt like everything they ever said was, you know, was definitive. There's no like, oh, maybe it's this or that. When they said something, you know, their opinion, I was like, okay, that's that's the answer. They they know what they're talking about. They're those kind of parents, and so they, you know, I, I was raised to to do everything yourself. You know, learn to do it yourself, work hard, and and you know, save your money. Uh, I, you know, they I think they got me a savings account when I was five years old, and that was the game was just to cut lawns and you know shovel snow and make all this money just to keep on putting it away whether it was going to be for school or who do what, you know, save for a house. But anyways, that was the, I think that's, that's the backbone of where I come from is, is what my, you know, what my parents uh, sort of instilled in, 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 in how they, you know, uh, how they raised us. But um, when, when snowboarding finished for me about 20, well, 2001, um, uh, a good friend of mine, Dean, uh, Dean Morn, who's, uh, he's, well, he was at the wedding as well. He's one of my best buddies, just like you. Um, he was the best man and, and you were the MC at our wedding. So, uh, he, uh, he got me into the film industry. So I moved out of Worcester, moved down to Vancouver. Um, 
got a house in North Vancouver, you know, got into the film industry. He taught me how to load film. Um, so I would go to, you know, at that time I wasn't in the camera union. So I was just in commercials, which were not unionized. And you could, you could essentially, uh, you could work on sets. Um, whereas film union sets, you have to be a member and you have to go through a training program. So, uh, I was raised through through him uh, how to load film, how to be a, a second assistant camera assistant, like what he was doing at the time. Uh, and so he, let me go back. He had moved down to Whistler about two years or three years before that and got into film. Um, one of his family members uh, got him in. So by that time, he had about three years of training and camera. So he quickly brought me up to speed on on that end. And I learned to do what he was doing at the time. And so we did that for, uh, I did that for about, until 2000, 2009, 2010, uh, while also working for Oakley, which is a whole nother, whole nother ball game. But uh, what were you doing for Oakley? Even though I know the answer, you had a great <laughs> job at Oakley. What was your I job at make, Oakley, Derek? Yeah, well, thanks to you, it was uh, I got to work in sports marketing at Oakley. I knew you were one of my biggest uh, uh, advocates for hiring Derek. Derek Hyde Inc. So uh, you know that was a uh, it was an amazing time. One of my old sponsors. Uh, probably one of the best sports marketing companies uh, in the world. Um, they invented it. Uh, it. It was, you know, it, it. I learned so much from from that company about how to brand and 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 build a brand and uh, you know uh, just everything. You know, it, it also gave me a chance to go back and find that same you know team manager that gave me an opportunity to find you know, new talent and, and, and work with these new kids and brand them and, and see them flourish and grow up and turn into these, you know, uh, amazing athletes, uh, winning the X games and, you know, winning contests. And so, um, and and that you did, uh, there is a lot of current snowboarders still in the ether of the sort of modern competition world that were kids that you cultivated when they were, 13, 14, you know, young, young athletes, and they're still out there plugging away. And it was years ago that you were raising them up in through the system. So good even, job. Even uh, Mark who McMorris, are some of the Mark McMorris was like, I think he was like not even 10, 10 or 11 when he first came to, to Calgary. And I first met him and uh, I was like, you know, you could tell the kid was, he was going to be huge, but clearly one of clearly. the world's best. Uh, yeah, pretty nuts. And there was a, a Dustin Craven, I think, was oh, attached yeah. at the hip. And Dustin, <laughs> uh, if Dustin. anybody wants, yeah, anyone wants to see Dustin Craven in Modern World, go back and watch this year's uh, Natural Selection yeah. that was held out in Revelstoke, which was mind blowing infrastructure to be able to do uh, an on hill. Oh my God. It was amazing. In the middle of nowhere, they had multiple Starlinks set up. They were drone filming, um, our drone, everything. our drone pilot, Gabe. Yeah. Um, and they were live streaming it and it was, I believe a 60 second delay from the middle of nowhere in the Rocky mountains of Canada beamed down to the head office in the U S where graphics were overlaid and then streamed out into the internet. Full HD it was a 60 second delay and they were, it was flawless. It was perfect. Yeah. Thanks to Elon because Starlink breaks the barrier a hundred percent makes that a completely plausible thing. And, uh, the drone pilots that fly like they're organically in the drone itself and can fly through tree gaps that I, that I, I sat watching this and I was like, if it was in 3D, I would have been freaking out because they're going through pockets no bigger yeah. than the drone in some of the trees. It was wild, yeah. which leads that's, me to a question. Did you guys lose any – did he lose any drones? Did a drone hit the ground there at all? Uh, no, not that I know. No. I mean, Gabe, Gabe, <laughs> Se- Gabe, Gabe 707 is like probably one of the best in the world. And he uh, – I don't think uh, – no. I don't think anything – Fucking shout out to Gabe 707 because <laughs> yeah. he – like, think about it, folks. You have an athlete dropping, not telling you where he's going to go, dropping down a face of a mountain that is incredibly steep with mm-hmm. varying speed through trees and flying off of cliffs. And the drone pilot is flying this thing within at any given point, 10, 15 feet of the athlete and yeah. perfect. It, it, yeah. it is so it's worth game. it. It's like a video game. It's so worth it to go back and watch. It's incredible. Yeah. yeah. It's incredible. 
Um, so sorry, sorry to derail you on that, but, um, my mind blows up with, but yeah, Craven, Craven, Craven was on fire on that event. That was the most amazing, uh, him and Travis were just, I mean, we were on set, uh, standing down and we were just sitting there, you know, watching both of those guys going head to head and, uh, yeah, amazing to see a Canadian once again. I mean, Craven, uh, just tearing up the backcountry. Um, that was, it's unbelievable. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's one of your kids. That's one of your kids. Like I, I was watching that and I was like, you know, Dustin was, I was working for Oakley at the time. He's kind of one of my kids too, a little bit. And I was like, mm, I, I feel a little connection with him and he's a friend and, and yeah. a very good friend of Mark Walton's. And so it was just unbelievable to see this. Anyhow, yeah. I digress. Please go back to uh, <laughs> Derek Height. So you're working at Oakley, you're doing this, you jump into the film business, which I remember laughing uh, because you had a full-time job with Oakley and I called you one day, I go, what are you doing? You're like, I'm on set. Yeah. And I'm like, why'd you answer your phone? He goes, it's really, it, it's cool here. I just wanted to let you know I'm on set. I'm like, dude, you have a full-time job. I have a question for you. And you're like, I'll call you later, Jay. And so I find out you're filming stuff in the background and you're starting a whole new career while being a powerhouse sports marketing uh force to be reckoned with building an insane snowboard team that nobody Burton didn't uh, Burton maybe had a team that strong. Maybe not though, because Oakley could pick from everybody, but you just, you had it. Um, so you're, you're doing this and you're getting there towards where you're going. How do you go from loading film? I know you sort of started pulling focus, which is a different skill set. So you're learning the film business as a tradesman in the film business. And there's no schooling here. You're just doing it on set. Yeah. So I'll give you the backstory. So yeah, my buddy Dean uh, was was still training me as a second AC, and uh, I did that till you know from 2001 up till about 2010. I was a second AC or a first AC. Uh, first AC is a focus puller. So he's the person who's, a- who's AC set. is what Derek for people assistant who camera. What you're talking about? Okay, thank you. Yeah. So, um, so essentially you're, you're there, uh, you know, at that time you would have your hand on, uh, on a, a r- remote knob changing focus marks on the lens. So, uh, you know, if the actor would step in to five feet, you'd have to, you have to be preemptive and set it to five feet and feather the focus as he walks into that, or if he goes farther away. So your job is to keep, you know, your, your subject in sharp. Um, and so that's what a first AC's main, main, uh, main job is besides building the cameras and you know uh rigging them in, in whatever configuration the director of photography wants and, um, and by that you mean like taking the body of the camera and uh, putting different lenses and different filters all the different things that stage the depth of field and color and all that sort of stuff is that what exactly you're speaking so filters to? uh you know crash housings or rain deflectors or let's say you're going to go handheld you have to build it into a handheld rig or if it's going to go you know, in studio mode, it goes on a dolly on the head and sticks. Um, so, you know, you're just, you're the, you're the first AC is a person who keeps on building the, the camera system uh, into that, you know, into that new configuration based off of what the shot is. Um, so I went between those two jobs for, for quite some time. Um, middle of that time, when I was still a second AC, this is a really funny small world again. Um, I, we were working on, I was working on a commercial and this is, so this is skipping between flying to Montreal or California over, you know, over a weekend for an event for Oakley, for Oakley work. I would yeah. come back. And so they, in Oakley, they hired my, my company. So they, they actually gave me a contract. I wasn't an employee. Um, so I had the ability to, to, you know, do other things. And so my company was also involved in film. So I had a lot of equipment that was being rented on film sets. So I would, I would literally change my hat. I would go to an Oakley event or go to the office in Montreal, take a red eye, go there for two days, hop out of there, talk about, you know, what events we're doing, what athletes we've got going on, uh, you know, what advertising we're going to put into what magazines, uh, you know, where's the budget going this year. And then I would get back on the plane, flip my hat, go straight to a set the next day with, you know, uh, one of the, you know, biggest, you know, DPs from LA who came up and we're doing a commercial with. Um, and uh, lo and behold, one time in between, was it 2005 and 2009 there was uh, rise of the silver surfer was filmed in uh in vancouver and so i got a call from from the camera department and they said hey listen 
we heard that you know what you're doing. Uh, you're not a union member, but you know the union wants to bring you in, and they'll you know they'll card you, they'll give you a membership. And I didn't have to go through the trainee program, um, so I'd been doing this for about five six years, and so they they grandfathered me in, so I didn't have to do a two year long apprenticeship. Essentially, mm. is what they usually have to do. And uh, I remember I just I walked out onto this uh, second unit, uh, Rise of the Silver Surfer, and it was like day one, and we had like. You know, there was explosions going off. They had bombs in the hillsides. They had, like, you know, things are firing in the air. They had helicopters coming down, shooting shots. I mean, I was like, you know, I'd worked in commercials, big commercials where, you know, big stars and, you know, lots of cameras. But when you go into a feature, you, you have – you've got helicopters. You've got cranes. You've got – there's, like, seven cameras working. Shit uh, is blowing se- up. Stunt sequences are huge. Yeah. And, um <laughs> And, uh, and it was really funny because, um, uh, one of the con- the camera operators, uh, this is where s- s- worlds start to collide was Tom Erickson, who was a, uh, um, a still mm. photographer in skiing. And we actually yeah. sponsored him with Oakley. Mm-hmm. And I, you know, I'm like, well, hold on a sec. Like Tom, you know, and he's the camera operator. He was operating, I think, you know, I can't remember if it was A or B. Uh, and I was instantly surrounded by action sports again you know I'm, I'm i've walked away from from action sports as an athlete i get i get into action sports with marketing sports marketing oakley handling all these different sports uh meeting all these new people and uh and and that's where i then pick up you know tom erickson who is one of our ski photographers and uh and it was just bizarre you know i spent the whole day the whole time i was on that movie it felt like i was at home you know it was it was the people I knew again, and um, and I love the the union side. So from that point on, I did a lot of you know I got into the union. So I started getting onto features and TV shows, right? And and that sort of flourished that whole that whole world for me, where I got to get in there. So um, so yeah, we started doing uh, I started doing more assisting camera operating, and then I started working for a specific company called Filmotechnic Canada. Who who ran a uh, well, they own a couple few a few businesses. They're award winning uh, Academy Award winning company that makes stabilization heads and uh, and what's called the Russian arm or now called the Ukraine. Um, uh, they had to change the name during obviously with what's going on in the world. And right it now. literally is built in the Ukraine. So it's from Kiev. Yeah. Um, yeah. When when the first Ukraines or Russian arms came into the states back in the eighties. The, the story goes that Americans just thought they were Russian and they would say, hey, you know, they're speaking Russian. And they're like, no, we're Ukrainian. And they're like, ah, Russian. Whatever. I mean, yeah. so in the end, uh, it got dubbed the Russian arm, which became <laughs> a trademark name. Uh, you know, if you look at Kleenex, everyone calls it Kleenex, but there's multiple companies that make tissues, but everyone just calls it Kleenex or Skidoo. You know, let's go Skidooing. Uh, that's what Russian arm ended up being. And um and so I started working with, with them. Uh, they had an office in Vancouver in about 2008, 2009. And I started to tackle all of their stabilization heads um, on set. So I, I started working. I got trained to, to, to operate and, and tech these systems. So I went from being an AC, uh, getting into more custom things where it was, you know, stabilization heads and, and fast chasing, you know, rigs and, and camera cars and, um and so uh segue into about two i did that for about three years um while still doing camera let's not cut too far forward while still having a job with oakley while then having and hosting the olympics in your hometown so there's like a pretty a pretty big bump in the road there of your things and you're doing a ton and when i say derek's a workhorse derek's a workhorse did I mention I have ADD and I have the ability to just go from here to here to here and remember where to take off and pick up from, but not have it drive me nuts? Um, yeah, yeah I have I'm going to explain my, issue. my, you have a huge issue. I'm going to explain my favorite Derek Height story that I tell everybody just to explain your workhorseness. Derek has a beautiful house in Lena and Derek have a beautiful house in Lines Bay and it's steep and Derek called me one day. He's like, I'm making a, I'm making a retaining wall. And I'm like thinking it's a tiny little retaining wall. I'm like, oh, that's cool. And every time I'd talk to Derek, when he would be flying in and out, cause you were flying in and out for film, you're flying in and out for Oakley or going to the airport all the time. And I would, you would land and you would call me and you'd be like huffing and puffing a bit. I go, what are you doing? He's like, I just got back from a flight. And I go, what are you 
doing here? I'm loading, I'm loading bricks. And I'm like, what are you doing? He goes, well, for my retaining wall. Every time you went to the airport, you went to the place that you bought your bricks from and you loaded them by hand into your Another pallet. And then, <laughs> yeah, by the pallet. And then you had to carry them one by one into and down into this crazy backyard where you were stacking them to build this retaining wall. And how many years did it take you to build this? It was 96 stairs and it was uh, four years of carrying 100 and it was 120 cubic tons of material. It was <laughs> over five, 5,000 5, uh, retaining bricks. 5,000 pieces is what it was, I think, in the end. Done uh, by hand. I, yeah, I have a problem. You I know, they make people. trucks and cranes. You know, they make those things. And, so a good and, buddy, a good buddy of mine came to the house and I told him what I wanted to do. And he looked at me and he's like, the first thing he did was like, you know, well, I can't bring an excavator down. He's like, we can helicopter an excavator into the backyard. I'm like, we're going to heli an excavator into the back. He's like, yeah, it's going to cost a lot of money. I'm like, well, how long do you, how long do you think it's going to take? He said, well, we still can't bring the bricks down there. So you know, the bricks, you know, it's going to be brought down by hand. Like I've got no way to do it. So it, the quote ended up being like, it would have been $125,000 if I had to hire someone to do this. Um, <laughs> or, I, destroy, I, I, or destroy your hands and shoulders over a four-year period building a wall. <laughs> I, I was in never better shape uh, than <laughs> actually when I was an athlete, when I would be hiking the pipe all day long anyway. So it, it, it brought me right back to the same cardio and the same uh, – um, you know, hunger for, for just doing something all day long. I, I don't know, but yeah, you're a different, uh, I, I build a lot of crazy stuff. Uh, and you know that yes, you and do, <laughs> you and I toss back and forth. Like you got every updated photo of the tennis court that I hand built. Like I'm an idiot. Yeah, insane. I get it. And I love it. However, you're absolutely like you are a, a tier above me in ridiculous stuff that you build. I should have just you bought just a ran ranch like you so I could just buy machines and just do it all myself. But I had to pick something on the side of a cliff. Yes. And it's your own damn fault. And it is. stop torturing <laughs> your wife because you torture her with your, your building. There's zero doubt. No. Anyway, sorry. Let's go. Back. You with me. So you've, you've done this. Have you started RVRD yet at this point? No, I, I, this is where I wanted to finish too. Is uh, we so we I was working for this company, uh, Filmotechnic, and um, in the end, um, they uh, at the same time that happened, um, Oakley was starting Red Camera. So Jim Gennard, uh, owner of Oakley, um, you know, I remember there was a day we were down in meetings, marketing meetings down in California, and someone had brought up that he was getting into cameras. And I, I was like, I had to ask him. I was like, you know, are we talking like cameras that are going to be like Best Buy? Are we talking cameras that are going to go to film sets? You know, and everything, any emails coming from Jim, I remember it was Jim at red.com. It was these emails mm -hmm. were coming out. And so I was just like, this is crazy. Like, you know, how could my worlds be colliding like this where, you know, and he was a passionate photographer. Amazing. I mean, the guy, uh, Jim is I don't know of anyone else in the world like him. I mean, he, the patents that he held and the materials he designed, uh, the technology he built, he furthered the, the film industry, sorry, the, you know, the digital film industry uh, and put a fire under everyone's ass, Airy, Sony, everyone. I mean, they all were catching up to red. Um, he single-handedly, yeah, single-handedly forced everyone's hand to move from film to digital and make it good. Yeah. That's it. I'm like he just did, crazy. he was like, fuck it, I'm gonna do it. And I, I remember chuckling and going, Well, if anyone can do it, it's him. Yeah. And sort of rolled my eyes and was like, Good luck with that. But he's a billionaire. Being a yeah. billionaire affords you a little bit of leeway to do crazy stuff. And, and being and being a genius. I mean when you're a genius. Yeah. yeah. I remember whenever we used to do marketing meetings, uh, and he would host them, you know, the the first half an hour of him talking was just like he's on a different level. I mean, he, he, he's a scientist. Uh, he's a materials engineer. I mean, he's just, he, he lives in different, a different world than all of us for sure. Um, very yeah, inspiring. He is inspiring. He's wild. Uh, he is a flawed human like all of us, but he definitely lives on a, a, a very high plane intellectually and uh, yeah. deserves all the money that he's ever gotten. And Elon um, Musk. Okay. You like Elon, but 
not going to space, just making cool glasses <laughs> and some really cool cameras. Um, so I remember clearly the day you called me, I was like, what are you up to? You were like all excited. You're like, I'm starting a new company. <laughs> and I'm like, really, what are you going to do? And you said, we're going to fly drones and film. And I believe I audibly sighed and was like, I don't get it, dude. That seems like a thing that people already do and probably do okay. And don't they use helicopters because the cameras are so big and aren't the lenses too heavy and like, aren't you're not going to be able to get the quality of film, like the film quality up to where you need to comparable to all these things. I just sat there and was like, these things were burning through my head. And I was like, well, amazing. And I hope I didn't sound discouraging, but I was like, okay, that's amazing. I don't quite get it, but like, let me, I, I'm in like, that's amazing. What can, is there anything I can do to help go for it? Like, and I love the idea. And then you were a billion percent, right? You like, you nailed it. You saw the miniaturization of camera coming down the pipeline. You saw the drones ability. Somehow you guys got into engineering your own drones, which is a whole thing that I don't even understand. And you started this company with your partner, Jason. And uh, it blows my mind. And I'm so jealous about the work you do. I, you, you know, but not many people know. When I started 54 Blue, my creative agency, I started by filming TV commercials. And I had a couple low-end consumer version uh, digital cameras, and I shot some local TV commercials for a local race team called Blackfoot Motorsports. And then about two months later, uh, Honda called me and said, we're releasing a new 450F. It's the first thing we've ever done in a four-stroke, and we want our Canadian uh, athlete, uh, I think it was Blair that we shot it with, Blair Morgan, um, on this bike and before you knew it i was renting helicopters and like seat belting hanging out the, the thing and making tv commercials and i made i don't know about i forgot you did that say, yeah it was about 10 commercials that i wrote and directed uh and all aired and they were great and the clients were happy so when i say i'm jealous of you i'm super jealous of you because it was a thing that i loved i didn't love a bunch of the stuff that went around with it all the like hanging around set and doing that stuff I didn't really yeah. dig. I loved the making of it getting and it the done. writing of it. Yeah, I loved yeah. getting it done. So I have a bit of an inside track on the work you do, but you've just like taken this to an insane level. So the newest films that you have coming out are of the likes of the new Transformers. Um, you have shot all of like, there's so many things I can't go through your IMDB without like being like seriously, just absolutely floored. Give me like a really quick breakdown of the projects you guys have worked on and you can go backwards in recent time. Please don't mention any films that you're not supposed to. So you don't break an NDA. Um, but like lost in space, uh, lost in space on Netflix, fucking unbelievable cinematography. And so much of it was you. There was a huge volume of this that was shot by my friend, which just like made, made me feel so good. Yeah. That, that, I mean, yeah. So we've, yeah, we've been bouncing, we do all the specialty work. So when it comes to uh, chase scenes, aerial scenes, anything fast to the ground that they want to have stabilized, um, that's what we now essentially focus on. Um but uh, yeah, we worked on, I mean, yeah, the new Transformer 7 that's coming out this summer. We shot that in Peru and in Montreal a year and a half ago. Uh, we spent a year on uh, The Last of Us in Calgary, that new Oof. HBO show that's uh, that's obviously killing it right now. And season two is mm -hmm. about to start hopefully this fall. Um, Yellow Jackets. Um, oh, my God. We shot, I mean, all kinds of stuff. I mean, we've been bouncing between so many jobs back in the day. Uh, we did bits on Revenant uh, when that was in Alberta. Um, geez, I, um, you, you literally I, have forgotten all of the amazing stuff you've done. When and you folks, turn up, let me tell you, go to the IMDB. Is it under your IMDB or is it under revered? Under revered cinema. Yeah. Yeah. Go, yeah. go and just take a peek. The list is, believe me, it's extensive. And Derek underplays the value of his footage because anything follow 
in most instances is you, whether you guys are on your one wheel, whether you're on that amazing off-road vehicle behind you that has deadly snow tracks that go on it, that was mm -hmm. used extensively in, um, lost in space, lost in space, whether it's the BMW behind you with the Ukraine, like there's, and you have multiples of all this equipment. You're sitting in uh, Vancouver right now. You've got an office in Calgary, uh, where you keep and store this stuff because you're back and forth between all these different territories filming stuff. And because the film industry here is booming, uh, you are booming and you're doing really, really well. Uh, yeah, and I'm really, really happy how Alberta just, uh, picked up and just laid it down with, with, you know, the tax credit. I mean, that's, to see Alberta, uh, to, you know, obviously the oil industry and that, at that sector softened up, but for them to have the foresight to, 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 you know, put a boost into the film industry, which was already always working well in Alberta, um, I'm I'm stoked to see Alberta. You know, uh, it's almost doing better than BC is now. Um, so it's it's great to see my hometown. We have bigger uh, skies, Derek. Bigger exactly. skies. Um, <laughs> the. You and your wife, both in the film business, must have been shitting your pants when COVID hit and everything shut down for a few months. I, I know I talked to you and I felt trepidation in your voice for about the first time that I have ever heard from you where you were like, I don't know. <laughs> um, you guys weathered through that storm, both of you, and came out the back end, like not firing with both barrels, but firing an automatic amount of bullets it was crazy yeah it was um the the industry that that was a crazy one because we um we ended up uh like family time was amazing um that that was one of the best things about um about uh about that um i know lena had a lot of a, a lot of problems um because she had employees and they had to deal with uh you know the government subsidies and, and that side so she had a lot of employees that she was having to deal with so uh, she had a lot more stress than I did during that time. But uh, being home with the kids and being home with my beautiful wife and family was uh, is probably one of the best things because the film industry is always so busy um, that it was uh, it was yeah it was it was a good good stand down. So, but and um, then you quickly flew off for how many months to go shoot the new amazing Transformers. And for anybody who hasn't seen it, please go look at the trailer for it. When does it come out? It comes out in the summer, uh, in oh. June, June, July now. So, and if you haven't seen the trailer, it's amazing. And I had the fortune, uh, to do a couple FaceTimes with you when you were on set and I got to see, yeah, go plug in. Um, I got to see the amazingness of what the new Transformers is going to be. It brings it all the way back into the history and it's all kind of old vehicles and different. And you guys shot in the most unique locations possible to be able to shoot a movie. You were up on mountainsides and very famous mountainsides um, where you're not really allowed to go. And you guys were doing crazy stuff. Um yeah. And the, uh, obviously the, this was all you because you're, you're the guy who films crazy stuff. That's your specialty. <laughs> well, they, uh, that, that movie was pretty, it was definitely, uh, was another level for sure. They, um, they had been working on the permits within it, in Echo because Machu Picchu obviously was in a, is in a heritage and historical site. Um, yeah. and they don't just, they are very protective of that area. Um, while we were there filming, uh, and this was one of the first features that they've ever allowed to shoot there, I think ever, let alone drones, a heavy lift drone that can fly at 15,000 feet, which were the, the, the drones that we manufacture and we right. built specifically for that project. Um, but uh, yeah, it was an honor to be down there and, and to be the first to be allowed to do something like that. Um, they'd given us a backstory about, you know, um, people in the past who showed up and, and tried, you know, they snuck a crane in and they were trying to shoot a commercial mm -hmm. in a certain area. And, uh, you know, da they, they something fell over and damaged a rock and, it, you know, they went to jail for a few years. So while we were there, uh, I mean, we went to ma all kinds of historical sites, both in at Machu Picchu and in around there. And every weekend when we were living out of another town called Cusco, we were going to these ruins uh, you know, all around. And, um, there was a, um, I think it was a, a cultural, was it a cultural engineer? I think you were called, and they were there to, to make sure that, you know, nothing was touched. 
uh, that, that, you know, there was no damages being done to the area and that we were being, you know, uh, essentially just treading lightly so that we would not impact the area at all. Mm. It was really, I mean, amazing to see how, how they, you know, they really, they really respect and take care of those areas. And they are, I mean, it's just an unbelievable place to be, let alone flying drones, you know, in these towering valleys. Um, yeah, yeah while you're is, filming, is, while you're filming Optimus Prime doing his stuff, which yeah. is crazy, <laughs> which is like, so, you grew up in that era, dude. Like you got to film old school I Optimus had, Prime driving down Machu Picchu. That's unbelievable. I had all those toys, all those toys when I was a kid. Yeah. Of course. Yeah. Of course. You did. And I'm, I'm a huge Porsche fan. So that the fact that, uh, that the 911 was one of, and Porsche sponsored the, the actual movie. Uh, we had a, a 911 RS uh, the whole time with three or four of them uh, doing all the chase scenes. Uh, it was, yeah, it was, yeah, worlds colliding again. All my favorite things. Who is the uh, director? I know the answer to this, but who's the director to the new Transformers? Stephen Cable Jr. was uh, was the director um, was the director for the main unit, um, and then Enrique and uh, Brian Pearson were the DOPs uh, for the second units that we were shooting. And, uh, DOPs um, are director of director of photographies. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. yeah right. Right. So um, we bounced between both units. Um, Pretty much, we were we were there seven days a week shooting. Um, there was always drone shots that they wanted to get extras of, which was awesome because I mean, you know, we, we there was one day we were at Machu Picchu. We hiked thirty six kilometers with all the drones and all the equipment. We had about twelve Sherpas with us, but we we'd hiked eighteen kilometers back in the mountains along the uh, the Inca Trail um, back to another ruins that was towering off the back of this mountain. I mean, it was a trip. The second we put the drone in the air, we were already thousands of feet over the valley floor, looking down at this ruins that was off the edge of the cliff. Like, it's just fascinating how all this stuff was built back in the day, and the people had the guts to to, to do that stuff. It's it is yeah. We were there shooting something, but we we learned so much about the history uh, of you know of, of Peru and uh, the Inca Trail, and it's just nuts. Absolutely so, beautiful. How long were you away from your family for? Because I will tell you, I called your <laughs> wife a couple times just to keep her company. Because uh, yeah. I would text her and I'm like, where's DH? And she's like, I don't know. He's in Peru somewhere. So I call her. I'm like, you okay? What are you up to? And I just call her every once in a while just oh, to make no. sure that she had someone to talk to because she was at home with um, children little, and little baby hunter. You know, yep. Yeah. Yeah, we when they phoned us, they it was a. Uh, I mean, we 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 were given knowledge that in, you know April that year they started to talk to us, told us what they wanted to try and do, what they wanted to shoot, um, and we said, yeah, no problem. We'll start to build um, heavy lift drones that can fly up to fifteen thousand feet, and then we built uh, a bunch of stabilized FPV drones that were going to do all the chase scenes, uh, you know, racing down. The, the hillsides of you know of uh, Peru, so we had to build um, at that FPV, time. FPV, Derek, with, first person view, first person view, yeah. So right. um, one of the latest drone things that's come out of the last three years are just cameras mounted straight to a small drone that they can just fly through very tight areas. And, and the and, operator uh, wears a, a goggle inside. Set of goggles, correct? yeah. So they're they're looking at a witness camera at the front of the drone, but they're also as they're flying the drone, they're yawing it around. They're actually they're actually manipulating, panning, and tilting the the camera that's recording as well by moving the drone around. So what you get is a a, a bird's eye view, like a bird was you know flying left and right. Uh, the camera's dutching you know with it. So um, you know there's very there's a lot of really good FPV pilots in the world, and we've got uh, we've got one of the best in the world, uh, Gabe Seven Hundred Seven. And um, and so we we worked with him uh, about building a, uh, a new FPV where you actually have a stabilized gimbal on it. So um, once again, the pilot can fly into these extremely tight areas and crazy little zones, but a camera operator can control the camera and the gimbal as mm. a separate thing to to take the amount of pressure off the pilot and uh, and be able to get more dynamic shots. And uh, you know these sy these systems will fly 100 kilometers an hour. You'll be able to outrace, you know, you know, the transformers racing down the mountainside, and and you know, pan around quick and and do these amazing wraparound shots that usually would be done in CG 
or you know just would never be done real uh, helicopters even um, these new these new systems um, have more agility and are faster than heavy lift drones um, amazing so it, was, it was a new a new tech and um, uh, and it worked really well so anyways they phoned us in April we started to build them by the time June came around and the the, the camera they started to shoot in Montreal we brought the systems to Montreal and we started shooting. Uh, but I remember I packed my bags, I left the house and I said, okay, I'm not sure when I'm going to be back, Lena, but maybe it should be like in a week or two. They're not too sure. And I got there and, you know, the first thing that the, uh, one of the, the, the camera, the DOP said was, oh, you're not leaving. You're, you're here till, you're here till August. And I was like, <laughs> oh, oh, really? You know, and I, I hadn't packed even close to enough stuff. But sure enough, we stayed there for all the summer, and then uh, and then Segway, we went straight into you know once we wrapped Montreal, we hopped straight on a, a chartered plane uh, with the entire crew, and we flew to Peru then for two and a half months. Uh, so I was gone for I think it was in the end six months straight. Um, but uh, yeah, it was you know I I think I learned that from snowboarding like anyone else. You, you you plan your trips, you plan, you know, you're going to go on a vacation in a couple of months, what you're going to need, what you're going to pack yeah. from snowboarding. It's like, it's snowing tomorrow. Let's throw a bunch of crap into a bag and let's, we're heading to Revelstoke or we're going to get on the plane and fly to Japan. You know, like it, it was always last minute and that excitement, that adrenaline that you get from doing action sports and, and hopping on a last minute thing. It's just, it never left my body. And that's exactly what the film industry is. It's same, the same yeah. anxiety, the same, you know, adrenaline rush, the, 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 you know, uh, is, you know, the, just the, the nervousness of it all. Uh, it's like an addiction and, uh, film ministry pretty much filled that void that, uh, I left when action sports ended for me. So, um, it's not for the faint of heart to say the least. The film industry is a, uh, you have to be ready for curveballs. You have to be ready to troubleshoot. You have to be, you have to be on your toes nonstop. And, um, there's, there's nothing of it is easy. Uh, at least not in this sector. No, nothing, <laughs> nothing is easy ever, ever, yeah. ever, ever. Um, so you guys are running around. How do like, you guys have gotten to the point where RVRD doesn't like, there's no outward real facing marketing from you guys other than your website. And then word of mouth is what I'm assuming. And your skills and all your past work or what everyone is buying. They're like, I need that shot from this Transformers clip I saw in my movie in a slightly different circumstance, but we need that same tech to be able to get that. Mm -hmm. You movies in, in my opinion are magic um, because there are millions of clips that get sewn together um, to create this continuous two hour, sometimes people go crazy and make three hour movies. Please Hollywood, stop making three hour movies. Uh, please Avatar. make them. Yeah. Like, come on. Uh, like crazy. Avatar, it's all, all good. All good. Three hours is a lot. I had to yeah. go pee like twice. It's crazy. It's <laughs> too many times. Uh, but, um, all of this gets stitched in and there's little microservices adding in constantly there's CGI, there's, you know, camera, you know, all these different camera crews feeding it. And it all comes together to basically give you this insane seamless image, which I don't think people understand that going from even camera to camera create creates an entire world of problem for color and the look and feel of what's actually happening in, di either digitally or under the film. Um, that, process is a nightmare blending footage in to get this stuff um so i believe it's magic you're a part of the magic you guys have gotten so good that you know this is a business-esque slash marketing podcast but this one is me just being in awe of you and the movie business and the stuff you guys do um you guys are good enough that you don't even really need to market the, the business is all coming to you and flowing directly. And I know that you're going to, you're going to deny that, but you don't really market. Do you? Well, it, it's a funny thing. Like, so we have an in-house uh, marketing uh, kid. Um, uh, of course. And hired. he's great. It's amazing. Yeah. He came straight out of school. Uh, my business partner, Jay, partner Jason, um, <clears throat> ended up finding him when he got out of marketing school. And, um, and, he, and it's actually, um, it's, he's amazing. So he, he polishes up, 
all of our, our websites, our PDFs, um, uh, like a big part of what we do is we're a problem solving company. So if someone comes to us and says, hey, you know, lost in space, we want to get snow shots with an arm swinging around. How do we do it? You know, and that's what we when we built the razor with snow track. So we 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 found what was you know what parts were out there, what parts we need to manufacture. You know, we built a, a chase vehicle that would do what they're asking, and and that's what we became. And in the end, this this company started as uh, as a drone company. Um, Jason, I'll give you some backstory. Jason was a VFX director. He had a, a production house in Vancouver here. He had quite a few employees, sure. and he. He would bid on these jobs and he would do the, the VFX work on, on these jobs. And what he saw at the time was a, a huge need for aerial work, which they'd always do usually with helicopter. And nearing the time that he wanted to get out of being a VFX director, he started to see a lot of drone stuff coming in. And the drone stuff at that time was a lot of, I mean, this is segue where we got into this too, was a lot of RC clubs, so radio controlled hobbyists that would come in that knew how to build, you know, single rotor helicopters or um, fixed wing planes and do this as a hobby said, hey, like drones are start are starting to come out. You can get drone uh, controller systems and it's a great platform, a stable platform to put a camera on and use for TV shows and movies. So mm -hmm. all the first original, you know, sort of companies that, that started to come in to film were hobbyists. And what they lacked was the the camera knowledge. They weren't a an assistant camera person. They they didn't know how to talk the talk. They didn't know, you know, that you had to focus pull or how what the camera setting should be, or no composition. And and that's where um, a good good friend of ours put us put us together. I knew Jason's wife. She'd been working on commercials, and uh, and Jason, funny enough, was a pro snowboarder as well that rode for Burton down in California. Mm -hmm. Um, so, you know, I knew his name, I remember seeing him in movies and, um, and sure enough, you know, two action sports guys again. And, um, and we, we started to build these, uh, drones. He learned how to, how to build them. Uh, we learned the engineering side of it. Uh, Jason sort of took that whole side over and I dealt with the camera end. So we used to have to hand build gimbals as well, which is the, the system that the camera mounts to. Mm -hmm. At that time, there was no Ronins, there was no Mobis, there was nothing. You had to buy a system called Alex Moss, which was a, a controller board from a uh, programmer somewhere in Russia. And <laughs> you would you would buy carbon fiber, you would build a gimbal and pray to God that the thing would work. Um, and that was our first jobs back in 2012, 2013. Handmade gimbals, handmade drones, fingers crossed, using parts that were, you know, battery technology that was archaic in comparison to what we have now. And, um, and so over time, you know, and that's what our, the basis of our company was, was, was uh, to, to do a lot of this, uh, you know, a lot of the effects work that was being done that he saw uh, is what a lot of what we do now uh, is shooting the plates and, and shooting these shots. That's not all we do. A lot of it is, you know, is main unit work where we'll work with the actors too. But um, the company's ground started with building drones uh as camera stabilization and what we learned over time of you know the last well it's 11 years now is that you know we would go to a movie you'd go to a tv show and they would do what's called a tech scout which is uh you know um you know let's let's um let's look at what the shots are going to be that we need you guys to do and this is you know uh, before the shoot actually happens and they would say we want you to use a drone and we're going to do this I'm like well that's a horrible idea. A drone's not for that. We should be using a cable cab. We should be using a chase arm, you know, like a Ukraine. Uh, we have an e-bike. Um, and their, their, their first thing was drones do everything. Drones do everything. And I would be the first to say, no, they don't. And no, you're not going to use a drone for that. That is a horrible idea. You know, it's putting, you know, it's putting uh, stunts at risk. It's putting, uh, you know, the system at risk. You know, we don't need, you don't fly a chainsaw, a lawnmower, flying lawnmower, you know, within a certain distance of, you know, a whole group of people. You know, if there's another way to do it correct, it should be with that other piece. Yeah. So there's always a right right piece and right tool for, for a right shot. So um, what we ended up doing was we ended up manufacturing more and more things. We started, every job came on. They're like, well, how can we get that shot over the water? You know, it's a drone shot. Well, no, no, it's not a drone shot. If you're going to be flying three feet off of it, you're going to be spraying all the water up. So um, anyways, we started building all these things and we have all these toys now. And in the end, 
uh, having someone, Kalen, uh, our marketing guy, sort of bring it all back together, uh, you know, build us, um, you know, you know, there's always the follow through when you were, when I worked with Oakley, you know, your website needs to match your leaflets, needs to match your style. Like every year had a different campaign. And when you have this many systems, you know, and you have a new campaign coming out or a new logo, oh my God, you have to go back and change everything. All the logos need to change and all the PDFs and all the websites, and all the, you know, the MailChimps, you know, every quarterly we try to send out a MailChimp to the industry of what we've just been building lately. You know, what, what is the latest technology? Uh, hey, this has never been built before and now we offer it and, and trying to teach um, all the people on our list, the producers, the directors, the DOPs, hey, this is the right tool now. We found a solution to why we can't fly the drone three feet off the water and spray everything, and, and you know, uh, which, you'll, which will happen when you're that low to the ground. Uh, yeah. We've now built a drone boat. We built a, an RC boat. And, um, and so uh, marketing, we, funny enough, I think we, Jason and I, it's so ingrained into us that we can't not not market. We love marketing. We love, you know, logos. You know, the logo and the name <laughs> was something that, that Jason and yeah. I worked on right from the get-go. Um, uh, and he's a marvel with with uh, with graphics. Uh, like, Jason yeah. is a super creative uh, guy on that end. So um, we love it. I mean, we build, we, we make tons of giveaway stuff that we give to all of the people we work with. Uh, I think I have Oakley to to blame for that uh, that need and want in the action sports in general. But uh, giving away yeah. marketing, free marketing stuff is is how it works in the film industry. We're a service You're... company. We're really not a we're not a company that 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 does marketing. There's no mar there's no magazines that we put ads in, or or you know we can't pay to put our ad in the end of a movie. It's just that's not how it works. But we do find creative marketing in a sense of giving away uh, products. Um, and and giving information mailers every quarterly uh, to our list of people that you know have signed up on our website or that we've just acquired over the last thirteen years, and um, and it really does make you know I, you know we've had people in LA that are wearing our hats and then you know a DP friend yeah. that's down there shooting a TV show be like holy smokes you know there's like there's two grips on our show right now that are wearing your hats and you'd send a photo I'm like hey those are the guys we just worked with in Transformers in Peru and. And now they're advocating for us down there. And so, I mean, it's really why we've gotten, we've gotten a lot of jobs, uh, you know, around the world, uh, you know, be, A, because of just having, you know, hats on people and, and that, that sort of talk, you know, happens on set and they're like, hey, you know, maybe we can bring them down or, um, or just being, you know, uh, forward thinking and creating new technologies that people haven't come up with yet um, that they need you. And that's, I'm gonna that's say surreal. It's it's the forward thinking and the good work. The hats are an amazing <laughs> bonus and all the other stuff. Um, hey, I'm going to umbrellas, umbrellas were great. I'm going to take a quick pause. I got to take a pee. I'll be right back. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Hold on. Yeah. yeah good. All right. And I'm back. <laughs> oh, uh, shout out to uh, pure North energy seltzer, which is uh, amazing and drinking two of those while talking to Derek has been delightful and had to make me pee. Um, <laughs> so there's a thing we do on this show uh, called the cool confessional. And I have lived a great life as you have. And uh, a lot of kids and others, like we are uniquely uh, blessed to have cool jobs, you know tons of cool people have cool access to all sorts of things. And, uh, I am far from a cool human. And in the cool confessional, uh, I've uh, released the one that I don't know if, if you watched your wife's podcast, um, but like I am deathly afraid uh, of getting back in the water on a surfboard. Last time I did, it was at your wedding and I had a panic attack and I sat on the beach and you had to come up to me and you're like, are you okay, dude? And I'm like, yeah, 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 yeah I'm fine. I'm fine. I was not fine. You and weren't because just cold. of that. No, I was not cold. <laughs> I was panicking because the, la the time before that I was in the water, I almost died with you. And it sucked. That was quite something. And so I think it's interesting to know these things. Uh, the one I want to release today on the Cool Confessional is I'm actually an introvert. And I have known that my whole life. And I don't act that way. So I consider myself an extroverted introvert. I have to try so hard 
to talk to people. In fact, my, my natural state and why I live out in the middle of the sticks is to not be around people. I am way happier. Uh, I do not do great at parties. I, I do do great at parties, but it is like an absolute straight torture for me to be there. And I have developed the skill sets to be able to act like a normal human uh, in those worlds. Uh, and I believe well, I you have the gift of the pretty, gab. I have the gift of the gab, but I try uh, avoid those situations at the most, which is a great idea. I should absolutely have a podcast because I hate to <laughs> talk in public and for people. I, mean, I can do it and I don't panic about it. Um, but today that's my thing is, this is not my natural state. My natural state is alone with a shovel, digging a jump or on my bike in the mountains, not even with friends by myself. And I love my riding partners, Mark and Brad Ralph and my nephew, Zach. I love them to death. I, I will, I, I, I like being by myself. It's yeah. my natural state. Um, so that that's what it is today. Just another little um, Jamie little isn't. glimpse in yeah, a little glimpse into the hot mess that's Jamie. Um, <laughs> what do you got for me? Because I know you got a couple things. Um, well, first I'm off, gonna, I'm gonna you're say a maniac. I'm... So <laughs> beyond being a straight up maniac, and God bless Kaylin, who's your marketing guy, because you are so ADD, and your partner is not far off of you. You guys have like. Conflicting agendas, mess. bouncing. Off. Oh, you are outrageous! <laughs> and so he is a gem. Never get rid of him because if he can speak Derek Height, mm -hmm. you're set. Mm -hmm. And don't get me wrong, you're brilliant, but you're on like ten subjects at once. Yeah. No, I, I I tend to drive people nuts for that. Uh, too many too many irons <laughs> too many irons in the fire is one one way to sum me up for sure. Mm. Uh, I yeah, I mean I usually try and I usually try to to I mean I'll always follow through and finish a project, whether it takes four years or it takes sixteen years, uh, it still gets done. But um, uh, I funny enough, I'm gonna I have one one funny thing from when I was a kid, but I'm gonna agree with you on what you're saying about yourself. Uh, I'm 100% the same way too. I've I've learned to adapt. Uh, where am I in my happy place? Same place. We're out on the coast, not in the city. Uh, I tried living the city life, and I you know I lived in Whistler originally, but I love being out, you know, in our little village where we live. Same as same as you. Um, I think it's it, it obviously it, it to me it's um, it's inspirational being there, and it's it it, it it's a good recharge before I go back to. Where I, you know, whatever job I'm doing each day. But um, I, I agree with you. I, I learned a lot about myself. Uh, after I finished snowboarding, I was hired to do uh, freestyle camps down in New Zealand. Sure. And so I went down in New Zealand for two years in a row and, and taught these freestyle camps to none other than non-English speaking Japanese kids. <laughs> and we're talking, we're talking 30 to 40 kids, uh, you know, every day that I'd have to do an in-class seminar with five days a week and do a two hour thing. And for me, I mean, I was the kind of kid in school that would, you know, um, I would try to make people laugh. Uh, that was my way of breaking into a group uh, was to try and make a joke, try and be the goofy guy, try and make people laugh. If I had to stand in front of the class uh, and be serious, I would, my voice would start cracking and I just, I couldn't, I was not a good, I was not, I'm not a good person to stand in front of a group of people. At least that's when I was a kid. Um, mm -hmm. I'm still not the best at it anymore, but when I did these camps, I learned for two months, you know, straight five days a week, what it's like to be a teacher and stand up in front of people and put together some sort of a curriculum and teach them about backcountry or how to build a jump or what avalanche, you know, how to watch out for avalanches and how to do an avalanche rescue. And, um, I, I learned a lot about myself, about how to, to calm down, to not be nervous, um, and, uh, and it was really fun. I love, I love being challenged, uh, you know, on that end. And I'm, I'm the same way. I'd say I'm an introvert all the way as well. Um, you know, it's, uh, you know, if there's the life of a party, it's usually, it's not me, you know, there's someone else that's, that is the, the joker or the, you know, the person that's, that's carrying the room. Um, I'm usually more of the person in the, in the back listening or hanging out with a friend chatting, um, you know, it's just never, or it's helping never been, your friend, 
or helping your friend off the boat <laughs> missing his pinky finger. <laughs> That's another story for another day, folks. Hospital and it was of- officially that pinky. Um, <laughs> we'll call him Mr. Boat. <laughs> yeah, Mr. Boat. Um, anyways, my my one, I think the one, the 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 funny thing, uh, anyways, I think we're kindred spirits on what you were saying about yourself. I'm in very, very much, and I'm sure Lena would agree too, uh, very much the same. Um, but uh, I'd say one of the things that was funny about me when I was a kid, I, um, you know, my parents, you know, were, uh, so, you know, we'd sit down at dinner every night and, um, I was just one of those kids that didn't like vegetables. I was just like, I, I, you know, you put a like Brussels sprouts or any of that stuff in front of me, I'd have a gag reflex. I just couldn't, you know, you know, they, and I get it now with my kids, you know, they say that the kids have a lot, have their taste buds are, are 10 times more sensitive than an adult. Um, and, uh, and you, and, and, and you just get that, that smell or that taste, uh, you know, it was a lot more potent for kids. So anyways, for pretty much my entire kid life living at home, you know, I used to just, when everyone was not looking at the table, I used to shovel the, the vegetables off the plate into my hand down below. And then I would stuff them underneath the table on this little ledge. And then when everyone was done dinner, <laughs> when everyone was done dinner, they would, you know, the, the dishes would be picked up and people would, you know, my parents and my sister would go and do the dishes and we'd go downstairs. We would go downstairs to watch the news or whatever. I'd go back upstairs. I'd grab a Ziploc bag. I'd scoop all the vegetables into the bag. I'd walk out the deck and I'd throw it on the neighbor's roof. And, and I did this, <laughs> I did this for years until, um, my neighbor came over and their roof was flooding and he came over with a tray, ah. a massive, massive, like, you know, serving tray. And I remember I answered the door and I was like, Oh God. Oh no. And you know, his name was Jeff Schofield. And he's like, Hey Derek, is your parents here? And I'm like, Oh no. And so my, you know, my mom and my dad come to the door and there he's like, you know, uh, so, if, you know, our roof is pretty damaged. We've got uh, the gutters were filled and, you know, we've got stuff backing up and, you know, and uh, we're going to have to replace this and that. And, you know, I knew exactly what it was. It took them a while. To, I mean, he knew what it was, too. He had opened one of them. And it was it was three years ago, Brussels sprouts rotting and sprouting in the bag again. <laughs> um so yeah, I, I don't know if that's it. I like vegetables now, but, uh, you know, when you're a kid, um I think I would have rather eaten ice cream and steak. So I guess that's the, that's the funny one, a funny one about me, but yeah, that's yeah. a good one. Um, I've got a, I got a side one is every time I get your wife to try be my agent for something, she never <laughs> takes me serious. I sent her in our podcast. I told her that when I had my elbow, uh, worked on, uh, in December, I didn't yeah, take right. any of the narcotics they gave me. I just took weed gummies. And I sat around and I ate weed gummies and watched Hallmark Christmas movies because I was just like, couldn't do anything. I was kind of incapacitated. Oh, those movies have told, basically paid for our house. Yeah, thanks, Hallmark. <laughs> and I, I told her, I'm like, I, I came up with two ideas for Hallmark movies and I gave her one. And when I was on holidays with my wife traveling around the US, she sent, she's like, oh my God, I get a text. Oh my God, read this. And I read it and it's one of my stories. Almost exactly. It was called Flipping Over Christmas. And I, I told her about it in the podcast. And she, she had a script from Hallmark that was almost identical. And I'm like, God damn it. And so I'm like, I was going to a spa that day. We were in uh, Palm Springs. And I'm like, hmm, I'm going to sit at the, pa- at the spa and I'm going to write my other Hallmark story out and send her the, the treatment for it. <laughs> I sent it to her. And all she did, she said, it's actually really good. I go, I need an agent to send this to Hallmark. And she just laughed. That's all she did. She just laughed. So either I'm not very good at writing Hallmark movies or she does not want to actually take me serious about my Hallmark movie career that I'm trying to launch. And that hurts. I'll work on, I'll work on her today for you, but I'm going to send you, do you you want me to read you the first part of my script? It's fantastic. You ready? Yeah, let's hear it. uh, Is there a drone shot to open the sequence? Read it in front. Oh, dude, this is all drone shots. It's crazy. <laughs> it's called Xmas storyline. Clint, so M Xmas, right? It's it's already a gem. 
M Xmas storyline. Clint, a country boy with his best friend, Max, a golden retriever, always by his side is a mid tier motocross poor underfinanced and slightly low on luck traveling from race to race. And it only gets better from here. It's crazy. Wow. And it goes on and on. I've got the whole thing. And she laughed. She laughed. Lena, <laughs> come on, send it to Hallmark. We got something. We need a here. Christmas. And then I told Christmas motocross. I've got a golf version. I've got a snowboard version. I could duplicate this a thousand times over. We could be the action sports Hallmark movie writers. And she's not taking it serious. DH. I got hurts your back. Me I got deep your back. Deep down inside. Hurts me deep down inside that she's not taking this script serious because it's a gem. By the way, it all works out in the end. Clint does okay. It's all yeah. good. Yeah. No, but Clint uh, is actually really Jamie Kalen, I'm sure. No, I these wasn't all, a promoter. These are all written about you. No, well, yeah, a little bit. There's a little bit of real life in there. There's no doubt. Oh, yeah. There isn't every good piece of art. <laughs> now, does Clint Anyways. get hurt? Does Clint get hurt at any point? Oh, my God. Yeah, here we How go. How do you get out of my head? You're in my story <laughs> with Clint. It's already there. Now, he, he, he uh, <laughs> okay. Do you want to hear the next part? This is where it actually gets good. This is where the good writing is. And this is probably blowing my chances that, of getting that opening line was pretty good. Okay. Slightly low on luck traveling from race to race. Clint stuck, Clint struggles to recover from a hard crash in a recent, recently broken heart. His ex broke up with him the same day of his big crash and his trainer and coach, a tomboy, Cindy from a small mountain town struggled, struggles to fish. Pardon me. Struggles to finish his chances of saving his career at the mid season Kringle X championships in her hometown. <laughs> <laughs> this is the last race where factory teams can pick up the wild card racer to join them for the rest of the season. Everything's on the line for Clint. Amazing. This, is, this gets deep and the dog gets hurt and he meets a sexy vet and he has to decide between the sexy vet and the tomboy Cindy. And of course it's the tomboy Cindy. The and she sleeps, she sleeps. She sleeps with her, his biggest competitor, I'm sure, right? No, she doesn't. This is Hallmark. Oh. This is not you porn. This is Hallmark, Derek. Now, I could write, if you porn wants this, I could change it a little bit and make it a, a sexier. I don't know. I don't. I heard some kids talking about you porn on the street. <laughs> Anyways, buddy, um, thank you. And thanks for being uh, absolutely entertaining and an amazing friend. And thank you for having me in your life. Uh, you guys are an you absolute um, treat in my movie. And you, you're <laughs> always welcome back in every scene. Uh, and everyone knows I built a tennis court. Uh, Lena is a massive tennis player. Um, you guys are coming out. We're going to have the OC Ranch Invitational, and it's a mixed doubles. And it's spouses, and, like boyfriend, girlfriend, or girlfriend, girlfriend, or boyfriend, boyfriend, however it works. Yeah. Spouses Good cover up. tournament where not only do we test your tennis skills, but we test your relationship. That's what okay. it's about in this tennis tournament. So and you better learn how to... Yeah, it's... Uh, mixed doubles and not only thing is being mixed is drinks and it's going to be great um so have you guys out in the summer you're going to be back uh please come out to the ranch and spend a bunch of time with us uh i would love that uh my beautiful wife's 50th birthday is happening this summer you'll get an invite for a party Amazing. i've already already booked the band mr uh, ben chase is playing and he is incredible uh country musician out of nashville coming up to uh oh, way yeah, coming up to play for my wife and our few hundred friends that'll be out at the ranch. And I uh, implore you not to be busy early August. I won't give the date specifically on air here, but we'll see you early August for that party. We'll, we'll pause our movie of life and, uh, and come to this commercial. It'll be a great segue somewhere, a little vignette in your movie. It'll be amazing. Amazing. We're there, uh, for Derek, sure. I love you. Yeah, thank you, Likewise, sir. Buddy. And uh, we will see everyone else on the next Marketeers Clubhouse uh, soon. We'll be uh, talking to everybody. Thanks, man. Looking forward to it. Thanks, Jamie. Bye-bye. See you, buddy.